Hello, and welcome to Found TechCrunch's podcast that brings you the stories behind the startups from the folks that are building them. I'm your host, Becca Skutak, and I'm joined by my spectacular co-host, Dominic Baduri davis Hey, Dom. I have a question for you. Can you speak any other languages? I speak a little bit of French. I speak okay. If you drop me in France, I can get around. Okay. What about you? I have like a baby understanding of Polish. I've been trying to learn it for years. I always say that like I couldn't do a conversation, but when I get my hair done at the Polish hair salon, I know they're not talking about me. So I know like enough. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I did like four years of Spanish and I can't say anything. I did five years of Mandarin Chinese and I only recognize the numbers. That's it. (laughs) Just not that helpful. (laughs) Why do you ask? I asked because today we have Marcus Witta, the co-founder and chairman of Babbel, which you probably already know, but if you don't, is a language learning platform that uses things like lessons, online classes, games, and podcasts to teach its users how to speak a new language. We had a great time talking to Marcus about the long journey they took of building Babbel and how all of the co-founders are ensuring the mission of Babbel stays consistent, even though they have all moved on to different projects. And of course, we have our new segment, Two Truths and a Lie, where I'm going to tell you two truths and a lie. And then after the episode, you have to tell us what was the truth? What was the lie? All right. So here we go. What was the lie in this episode? That no founder has ever sold a share, that Marcus is a big believer in the co-CEO model, or that the Babbel team has been working on incorporating machine learning from day one. Day one. Gotta remember, this company started back in 2007. Those are really good ones. So you guys should listen in to the conversation to find out which one is true and which one is not. And here is our conversation with Marcus. Hey, Marcus, how's it going? Very good. Hi, Becca. Hi, Dom. Hey. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. I'm really excited for this one because I think me, Dom, and some of our listeners are already familiar with your company. But for those that are not, maybe if you want to start there, tell us a little bit about Babbel. Babbel is a language learning company. Um, It all revolves around an app. But now it, it is even an ecosystem where you can learn in very different ways in live classes, through the app, through podcasts, whatever you choose. And uh, what we try is to help people connect and understand each other through language. And I know you guys have been around for quite a while as far as startups go. Maybe if you want to talk a little bit about the founding story. And I know there are three other co-founders, how you guys all got interested in this idea to begin with. Yeah, we have been around since 2007, actually. So quite a while. Launched the app in 2008. How we found each other was through a company we all worked in, in the music software world. So we all build music software products. That was actually what we ventured into and wanted to do. Build a prototype for an online sequencer, a SaaS product, if you want. And before we even launched that product, while we were still working on the prototype, one of my co-founders wanted to learn Spanish and came to the conclusion that you can't learn a language on the internet, which was a complete surprise to us at the time. So we thought, ultimately, that is a problem we could solve. In a way, we were wrong because we didn't have the knowledge or expertise to do this. But like it happens so often, once you start into something, then you find the means to make it happen, ultimately. And that's very interesting. Now I'm thinking, like, what was it like in 2007? I don't know how you would learn a language. I guess you had to do it the old school way. So when you're starting a company like this, what is the first thing that you do to make language on the Internet and like digitize language? What's the first step to doing that? I think it has dramatically changed what you do today if you start a company and what we did back in 2007. What we did was to imagine a product that is actually usable and that worked well from a tech perspective. And that was mainly a vocabulary trainer. It wasn't a very good product in terms of learning a language. From a tech perspective and usability perspective, it was pretty good. So how you do that is you sit down and code. And that's what we did. There wasn't so much more magic to that. That was what we were used to do. And we just got together and set the common direction and then coded until we had something that we were still ashamed about, but happy to show to everybody. Now, it's so interesting to think about building something to help people learn something you guys were struggling to learn on your own or your co-founder was. Because so often you come across founders who are like, oh, I'm building in this area because I have expertise here or I have this 20-year career in this specific industry. So it's so interesting to hear 
your story of trying to solve your own problem, but not having experience in that area. And I know something that's interesting about getting launched that early. So much has changed in the tech ecosystem since then. I, was the App Store even launched in 2007? No, there was no App Store. That was the first iPhone that was not really something you wanted to have. I was on a Google G1 phone the first two years of the existence of Babel. So no, that was pre-App Store. Mm. So what has it been like building since then? Because I know not only has tech change and sort of like how people interact with technology, people are more onto the apps now. Of course, back then it was probably more web-based, internet-based. And there's also been a lot of competition come into this space as well since you guys launched. And like, how has it been? Of course, obviously, Babel is still known. People are still using it today. What has it been like navigating the changes outside of your control since you guys got started back in 2007? The changes were pretty dramatic. I think the biggest one was the launch of the App Store and the success of the App Stores. On the web, people didn't really search for language learning. So nobody, very weirdly, nobody had the idea they could learn a language on the internet. So the search volume was almost zero. Once the App Store got going, people got used to doing everything on their phones, including language learning. So there was, for the first time, a demand for online language learning, which completely changed the whole equation of how you get a product to learners, to users. That was a huge difference. And of course, the whole product needed to change to work on such a small screen. And admittedly, we first thought, ah, no, you can't run a language learning app on a phone. It's impossible. It will never work. But we had to learn it the hard way that it does work. That was a very dramatic change in all direction. Distribution, the tech stack was different, and the whole product needed to change. And I don't think competition wasn't a big thing. For us, one very, very big change was introducing subscriptions in 2009. So rather early when it comes to subscription, that was not the solution for every business back then. For us, it was in a way necessary to stay aligned with our users. And we thought advertising in a learning product is just unthinkable for us. It just ethically didn't work. So it was mainly the only path open. And that for us was a huge change. And back in 2009, when it was so funny talking to investors who didn't at all get the math around subscriptions. We really had to explain the whole statistical models around it. And now it's the most common thing in the world. But back then, that was really challenging. Yeah, that's interesting. So the whole business model changed. And now, of course, is the second change that is as fundamental as the change to phones. And that is AI as a, a driver for extreme change in the whole industry. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that, like going back to investors, what was it like trying to get capital to get this business off the ground? We were lucky in two ways. In one way that we had worked before, had put a bit of money on the side and could finance the company for the first 18 months out of our pockets. And even beyond that, work without a salary. So that was a privilege that we had. Very helpful to not need investment from day one. After that, fundraising was terrible because like Berlin was not a good place for a startup back then. And if at all, startups were about online commerce. So e-commerce was the big thing. Everybody understood it. But a language learning product, that was really out there. And we had to really look for investors for quite a long time. Our Series A was below a million dollars. So um, that was the one time fundraising wasn't fun for us. Yeah, because I noticed looking at your fundraising history, and maybe, of course, this is also just a difference in the startup market today versus 10 years ago, where companies now raise seemingly like every year. You guys have only raised a handful of rounds, sort of very spaced out, which isn't as common anymore. And was that, were you guys lean by design or was that kind of, playing into this where fundraising was also just really tough for where you guys were? We were also lean by design. We wanted to live off our users rather than from investors' money. It was a deliberate choice. We were cash flow positive from 2011 onwards, so rather early in the journey. And we got there with this very tiny Series A and a bit of debt, so very minimal capital. I think we burned below $2 million to get to cash flow break even. But that is more the spirit than necessity because once we got traction, all the follow-up rounds were so easy to raise because we had proven that this is something that works. And we didn't have to explain for very long that language learning is a large market. Everybody understands that right away. 
I see that you got covered in TechCrunch in 2008. And so I just wanted to, I just want to ask, how did you get into TechCrunch? I mean, because I don't know, I just, there's no right way to phrase that. How, how did that work? Back then, it was, it was like winning the lottery. For us, it was the game changer. 15th of January, 2008, I still remember it. Oh my God. And, and it was the first day we were online. And uh, what we did was to just, uh, TechCrunch had a form, an online form, where you could submit your press release. So we drew up a crude, self-made press release that nobody reviewed who had ever done PR. And we uploaded it to TechCrunch. And somehow it caught somebody's attention. And we found ourselves prominently featured on TechCrunch. And then, of course, accordingly on other media, which totally exploded our servers. We were, I think, day two at the triple of our total objective of users that we had for the first year or so. So it was just totally out there. The interest was so high in language learning once you put it in front of people. So yes, TechCrunch is the beginning of the part of Babel that is a success story. And you've mentioned a couple of times now about how large the language learning industry is and the demand there. And maybe if you do want to talk about that a little bit, because I can like kind of think about what this would look like, but I don't really have a concept of how much demand or how large the market would be for these language learning products and how much has it changed? So there's different ways of looking at the market. You can look at the current market volumes or how much revenue is made in language learning. Most of that is still online or in live classes, so rather traditional methods. Online self-learning is a fraction of it. It's maybe 10% of the whole market as of now. And we have already have a good portion of that. Another way of looking at it is how many people in the world throughout their life learn a language and how often do they get back to it? And that is huge. It's incredibly big how many language learners there are in the world. So if you have a good solution for that and if you can help them on their way, the market is massive, way beyond what we currently see in compound revenue figures. But if you look at app-based online language learning, it's a comparably small market, single-digit billions. Definitely. You mentioned AI. So I'm trying to now think, because I guess like in the beginning, you were talking about how you coded all the languages. How has AI changed that in terms of getting languages on the platform? I obviously am not a coder. And so I'm just like, how, how has AI changed all of that? Mm -hmm. So we were used to the good old machine learning because one of my co-founders specialized in machine learning even in the 90s. So, so that was something we worked with on different areas. But what has changed in the last 18 months is that we can now use generative AI to help teachers build lessons, to understand user demands and needs way better, and to dynamically deliver parts of conversations or speech recognition is now at a complete new level using today's AI tools. And this is just the beginning. So it's a bit like the early days of the iPhone, where you have this shiny thing that is in a way very interesting, but you haven't figured out that you can use it to, to book a taxi and revolutionize the taxi industry, for instance. And I think that is in AI, we're at a point where everybody kind of understands change is coming and this is very powerful, but we're just scratch, we're all just scratching the surface of it. And the interesting part is how we use that for new products that we haven't thought about yet. So I think we're doing a lot of the stuff that is pretty clear and almost obvious. We're going beyond that with a couple of product features and ideas in some areas. But again, the journey just starts. And I don't think anybody already has figured out how to use or what the limits are of deploying AI in apps and in language learning. And I was just going to ask one last question focused on the actual product, because I know you mentioned when you guys got started, it was sort of like a vocab training exercise, which I know from attempting to learn a language online, you can find a lot of those resources. How did you guys decide to add these different products that you have expanded into, like you mentioned, lesson plans that teachers can use and things like that? Why did it make sense to kind of add these things? And are you guys going off of what consumers are asking you for or existing users? How do you guys decide to expand to these different areas? So that goes back to how and why we started. So we started basically as users of our own product and more with a question than with an answer. I think that made us more flexible than a couple of other teams because we didn't think we know the solution. We are still searching what is the best solution to learn language. I think that will be an ongoing search. 
the first step was we built a product that we saw a lot of interest for. And then we saw that you can't really learn a language with it. And that was a bummer because we didn't want to keep people busy, but to actually help them learn a language. Like looking back, solutions are sometimes obvious. So the obvious thing that we did was to hire people who actually know how people learn a language. For tech people, it's not always the first step to ask people who know their field, but very often we reinvent stuff or feel, can't we do this using machine learning? And that was a game changer. Bringing educators on board was a complete game changer, helped us to completely revamp the product. And in 2009, we launched a product that was everything but just a vocab trainer. And then over time, we of course kept interviewing our users, how they can use their language skills in real life. Because what you track in your app in terms of success metrics is a close feedback loop. If you optimize your app for stuff that you can measure in the app, you end up building a game. People get better at using your app, not necessarily in speaking a language in the real world. So we had always did panels with real world users and, and tried to understand what do they need to get conversation to get to their learning objectives. And the answer was consistently, yeah, I used multiple methods. I used the app, but I also went to language classes. I watched movies in the learning language. I, I did games and whatever. Right. We first thought, oh, we have to overcome that and build an app that can do all that, but then gave in to the fact that a multi-mode way of learning is always more successful than just using one, one mode. And if you're learning a language, the one thing that you can always use together with every other mode of learning is a mobile app because it's affordable and it doesn't take up a lot of time and it's kind of the centerpiece of a digital language learning journey. No, that's so funny to hear you say that because I just got this morning, my dad has been learning French for a couple of years on um, Duolingo and he sent his like Duolingo wrapped or whatever, but he keeps, he's learning French and he keeps going to France and then getting too afraid to talk to people while he's there. So it's like, he's like not trapped in the app. He's looked at taking classes and stuff like that. But it's so interesting to hear you say that because it's definitely true. He's been learning for a while and still gets scared to talk to people. Mm -hmm. It's like, just try it. And that is a huge, huge advantage of apps that even for those of us, and I'm definitely in that camp who are more on the shy side, we can try in a safe environment where nobody's laughing about what we try to do. But eventually, we all have to get out of the closet. And I think the challenge for us as a language learning provider is to make these steps not too big, to give like a step-by-step -step opportunity to try a bit more First thing, speak to just the speak recognition, but get speaking and then be in a maybe in a one to one with a real teacher and then maybe in a class and so on and so forth. So not throwing people into the deep right away is the best for most people. And now we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back in a second. I wanted to switch gears just a little bit because you spoke about starting the business and the journey of running the business. When did you know it was time to step down as CEO and let someone else take over? <laughs> I took the decision in the late part of 2018, but I didn't feel it was time. It was a different thing. It was a very, very personal decision. As a CEO, I became more and more effective the more the company grew. It's kind of the reverse of many founders' experience, but I was kind of the weakest of the founders in the first part because my coding was kind of not as good as the others. I wasn't a designer. My marketing skills were more mediocre, but it turned out that I work out as a CEO. And the point was really a personal thing that this job felt like such a good fit. And I felt it's so relevant what I do that I wanted to know who am I without this job? What is the core of my personality if I subtract this kind of exoskeleton of relevance that I have through this large organization? And that was already 500 people. That curiosity was, was a big driver. And the other driver was pretty clear that from a certain step on, I needed to decide, do I want to be the chairperson or the CEO? And I felt the company should have a founder chairman and just to keep air cover. And I had a fantastic successor in the company. It's a complicated decision, I think, but it was not an obvious one at the time. And staying on the succession piece for a moment, I wrote a story a couple months ago about 
founder succession and how this current market, some founders who are planning to maybe take on a chair role after the company went public and now plans are kind of out of whack with timelines and things like that. And how this is just like a part of the venture ecosystem that people just don't talk about as much, despite the fact that if you join a public company, you have a succession plan from day one. You mentioned finding having a really good successor when you did decide to step down Maybe if you want to talk about a little bit about what that process was like and how you guys navigated finding that next person to take Babel to the next step. To be totally honest, I was more lucky than, than it was designed. So I had brought on somebody in 2015. He back then was, his first job was CMO. And I rather quickly understood, wow, this guy can do a lot more. And he has such a deep interest in the mission of the company, a deep interest in what the product does. He's not just a CMO. But did I hire him for that? No. So I can't pride myself with having thought about this. At least once he was there, I saw like, okay, if I'm hit by a bus, he's the one who who should take over the wheel. And that was for the first time absolutely abstract because I thought I'm going to do this forever. It's the best job in the world. It was kind of the best job in the world. And that was exactly why I gave it up, which is a pretty weird thing, I think, for a lot of people, but that's what it is. So I was lucky. Nowadays, I work with founders on their path and, and mentor them a bit in the growth stage. So it's an important advice or one piece of advice that I give founders. And I think it's important to identify people that can take over and might not be a part of your hiring because usually in a startup environment, you try to keep things from falling apart. You don't usually solve problems that are kind of three or five years out. But once you you have somebody that could be a successor, you should definitely keep an eye on them and foster them. And something else I wanted to ask you about is this, you were a co-CEO. And I know there's been lots of thought leadership, I guess would be the best way to put that, about how either the co-CEO model really works or the co-CEO model really doesn't work. It seems like people are like very much on one or the other side of the camp and no one's like, oh, it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, which you could say that about all leadership structures, essentially. But why did it work for Babel and kind of why did you guys decide to do the co-CEO model to begin with? Well, it wasn't a co-CEO model, really. It was the face-over. So it was for, I think, six months or or so in 2019. Arne and I decided that before he takes over as CEO, he wants to be in the loop with everything. So to stage it a bit, we had recreated that role. And it was kind of a weird setting because we didn't have two co-CEOs, but one CEO and one co-CEO, like a pilot and a co-pilot. It was that kind of setup that the successor got the opportunity to look into everything and be part of everything like a co-pilot is and then take over. So it was just a phase over idea. If it comes to uh, shared leadership on the top level, I'm not in the camp of co-CEOs being a good solution. I'm rather skeptical. I mean, there are cases, as you said, there are cases where it works, but I would be rather conservative there. Yeah, there are not many cases where it works. No. It works for some people, but it doesn't seem that broad of a solution. But Speaking of like multiple people being involved, I know you guys also have four co-founders, which is quite the group. And sounds like you guys are all still involved in some way with the company. Well, we are all, uh, nobody ever sold a share. So we are all still meaningful shareholders in the company, which is great, I think. None of us is operative in the company anymore. Thomas was the last to leave this year. We're still very, very much aligned. So as shareholders, founders always have one position at Babel, which is, I think, remarkable. We blindly trust each other, which is also remarkable. Working together was not always easy, which is, I think, fact for every founder team. So over time, people decided to step down. Juan was the first. He's the techiest of the tech guys. And his journey was more into crypto stuff and other things. Babelcoin, maybe? (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm not sure if cryptocurrencies is the, the hottest stuff right now. So, um, But Fun was definitely the, or is a deep tech 
person. And and the first 18 months or so, it was fun for him. And then it got like bread and butter from a tech perspective. Uh, Lawrence is the early stage inventor founder, the zero to one person. And he founded his start company, which is also successful in the meanwhile. I think for every founder, there's a moment where, for whatever reason, they decide to do something else. And that was the case for us. I think what I'm so extremely thankful for is that we never got into fighting with each other, but resolved all the the friction that occurred in a very kind and, and thoughtful way and always had real deep trust in each other. Speaking of shares... Um, Can you talk a little bit more about the decision to, I guess, postpone that IPO in 2021? Yeah, you remember that markets were at a certain point quickly deteriorating. There was a Chinese company called Evergrande that immediately caused havoc in the market. So the climate had changed and we saw that the path forward was not very sunny on the public markets. If, If you look at it now, we're so happy that we're private. And we were late enough in our process to see this coming. You could take both views. Like if we had been earlier, we would have done a successful IPO. Would we be in a very good position right now as a public company? Would we be in a better position than as a private company? I don't think so. So I'm pretty pretty happy we took that decision. Am I happy that the markets deteriorated? No. (laughs) So you're probably going to stay private for a while? I would guess so. There's not really a public market for education companies or for everything that sounds like education. So no, I don't think so. I don't think that we're going public anytime soon. And for me personally, that's not the biggest question. So I'm always more interested in the path the company takes than what happens with the ownership structure. Somebody needs to own it. But over time, I got so deeply attached to the company, its employees and its mission that that is the main thing that I care about. And honestly, that wasn't the case in the very beginning. We started as just a a startup, but over time, it really got very, very dear to us. And since you mentioned that caring more about where the company heads as opposed to necessarily who's owning it, what are you hoping for Babel for the next five years? You guys are close to that 20-year mark four years away. So like, how do you guys feel about the next five years of the company? I would measure the success of the company in, number one, how much learning success can we deliver to our users? And that depends on how good we are in evolving the product or products using AI and other novelties and really extend what we call the ecosystem of learning experiences. That is the key. We try to measure learning success, and that's the North Star for us. And that's where I would see this going. And I strongly believe that the way forward is to find the best learning experience for each user. Because as language learners, we are unsure how to learn. It's very hard for us to say, oh yeah, I need this way of learning. A language class would be the right thing for me. We don't have that expertise, but as Babel, we have the expertise and we can see patterns. And I think it's on that level that we can be most helpful. The other parameter that I would look at is the team. I'm so proud of the team that we and the culture that we have built, how inclusive it is, how diverse it is. I still meet all the new joiners and I'm so I'm so humbled by the reasons why people join Babel. It's the first thing I do with every new joiner. I ask them why of all companies did you choose this one? And for me, part of the success of the company is to keep and and evolve this inclusive, diverse culture that we have. No, that's awesome. Did your co-founder ever learn Spanish? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, to a certain degree. The the fun fact is that I only was able to use our own product in a meaningful way after I stepped down from my CEO role. Because if you're using your own product, and if you're a manager in this company, everything that you come across is meaningful. You come across an error, you end up writing an email to somebody. And it's so hard to really focus on the learning experience versus focus on, oh, how does this happen? We need to change this and so on. So you're always on the meta level. And for for Lawrence, he speaks a bit of Spanish now, but uh, I wouldn't say he blew it out of the park 
And while we are our own users, it's honestly really hard to do this. Now I can do it. Now I, I'm really using Babel quite a lot. But it's a different perspective if it's not your day job anymore. Well, I think we're pretty much at time. But thank you so much for coming on, Marcus. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. And that was our conversation with Marcus. Dom, what did you think? I loved it. I loved hearing about him. But before we dive in, I got to give mm. the lie. Dun, dun, dun. Did you guys identify? Give the listeners what they want. Did you identify what the lie was, y'all? Okay, so clearly the lie is that Marcus does not believe in the co-CEO model at all. No, which I think is fair because, yeah, sure, it works for some companies. I say that, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Yeah, I know. Where that model has worked. Yeah, no notes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> But yeah, what else did you find interesting for the conversation? I just loved hearing about how one of the reasons it started was because one of his co-founders wanted to learn Spanish. And then in the end, he still doesn't really speak it. No, that's so funny. It's like you could make so many jokes about that. It's so funny to be like, oh, I want to learn this thing. So I'm just going to build a company to teach myself how to do it. Like, it's just like, man, there are a lot of easier ways to do that, probably. But He's like, I wanted to learn Spanish. So I built this multi-million dollar company to help me. <laughs> And I still and didn't, didn't learn it. <laughs> no, I love that. And it's so funny to think about that. Obviously, Babel's like, most people know it. And it's a big company, as you said. And a lot of people use it and probably have learned languages on it. So it's so interesting. That's such a big part of the origin story. Yeah, it's also interesting to see how this is basically like the OG language learning app. And they've been around for so long. In the beginning, I guess you couldn't. How were people back in the day just learning languages? Like, I could not imagine just... When did those languages for dummy books come out? Like, how were people doing this? I feel like it must have just been like Rosetta Stone, right? Like those CDs, I think. Oh, I forgot about her. Oh, yeah, I haven't... I remember we'd never owned them because they were really expensive. And you had to buy so many to like actually learn a language. It's like you can't just buy like one CD and just learn pleasantries and then like nothing else. So it's like kind of a big commitment. But I just thought what was so interesting about that part of it too is the fact that they launched it as a subscription or added a subscription model like very early, which is so interesting the way he talked about it being like, oh yeah, and at the time people were like, why would you do a subscription model? And like, why does that make sense? Whereas like now it's like, that's like every VC's favorite business model. I know his company is really like a snapshot in what everything was like in 2007 and 2008. Because obviously now the things that are just so obvious for a lot of startups to have, you know, these subscription models, even like ed tech, the ed tech space is, you know, it's doing, it's pretty good. So hearing like back in 2007, Berlin is a capital, like it's like a big VC hub now. Oh, I know. That surprised me too. I was like, yeah, I've always thought of Berlin as being like one of the hubs in Europe, like London, Berlin. Those are like the top two. Yeah, and so hearing Paris? that, like that, even like in 2007, it was like a little challenging to fundraise. I'm like, things are so different now. Yeah, it's funny too, because like the same theme, he talked about how they've been using machine learning the entire time. I'm sure a lot of companies from that time have as well. But because we like didn't talk about machine learning and AI the way we do now, it's like we wouldn't know that. But he's just like, yeah, of course we were using that from day one, which like makes sense to think about now. But it's funny to think about how much it's changed how we talk about that. I know it's another one of those companies where I'm like, oh, yeah, AI was not invented two years ago by, I don't know, Elon Musk and all of them. It was clearly it's been around for a while because I'm thinking like, of course, a machine learning model would need to be used for this app because otherwise, right. like, how would it work? Like, I don't know. Right. No, exactly. It's like a good reminder that there's more of this tech than we like talk about. Yeah, but you know, I also really liked, he was, we were kind of talking about this before where he was like just very European in terms of how humble he was yes. talking about his company. No, I know. And like the thought of stepping down because the job is like too good is like, I don't know, I just couldn't imagine doing that. But like, I like get where he's coming from the sense of like, okay, well, I've done this for a long time. I'm like too comfortable. I get that. But like, would you step down for a position like that where you're like, I have the best job in the world, like time to go. I don't know, because he was asking philosophical questions. He was like, who am I without this job? You know, I want to experience life again. And I was like, OK, that's kind of a sleigh. I was like, yeah, you know, I support that totally. But I'm also thinking, like, you have to be probably so mature <laughs> um, and so not obsessed with, like, greed and hyper growth to come to a conclusion like that. Yeah. Because a lot of times ego is like a big part 
and starting and running a business. And so for him to say, you know what, someone else can run this. I'm going to live my life a little bit. I was like, okay, I can get behind that. For sure. And it's especially super interesting, too, to when you remember, like, the context of them specifically, they haven't sold any shares. So, like, Marcus hasn't sold any shares. So it's not like, oh, I'm leaving my job because this company has already made me very wealthy and I can kind of just, like, hang out now and, like, pass the torch or whatever. He left and it's like he still owns the same stake and is doing other things. They didn't get that exit yet. Yeah, because, you know, I bet you they could have IPO'd in 2021 and I bet you they would have hit like a nice billion dollar valuation, but it probably would have crashed very soon after. (laughs) But I bet you like he easily could have walked away with like a lot. It was really smart for them to say, no, maybe not right now. And it is, again, I think what you're saying, just like so European So just like not the like money hungry, power hungry American startup founder, which like there's nothing wrong with that either. But him just being like, oh, yeah, the IPO didn't happen. But like, I don't care who owns the company as long as it's like still moving in the right direction. It's just like so against the narrative we hear here. And I also love the old school TC shout out. Oh, I know. Like 20... What was it, 2008 the article was in? So we we have the article and it just says contributor. Like, who wrote this? If you wrote this article, please email us. Who wrote this story? Please let us know. And I love how it's like, it's just like this app exists and it totally changed everything. I love hearing when TC articles do that for a company. Oh, I know. Because it's like easy to feel like you're in your own world when you write this stuff sometimes. So it is always fun when like a good company that deserves like good recognition is able to get it. And also, I mean, I feel like I also have to note that when you mentioned Duolingo, he didn't even flinch. I know. He's like probably scared of that owl like we all are. I like, just, he I, doesn't want to say anything. I just have like images in my head of that owl beating me. <laughs> like, I'm so scared of that owl. I know. That's why he probably like knows better than to say it. He doesn't want that owl visiting him later. I get it. He's like, I'm not even going to acknowledge this. <laughs> Something I meant to ask him was, what was the first language on Babel? I assume it was Spanish, but I don't. Do we know? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it was Spanish. Imagine it just like wasn't. Like <laughs> Irish just really built this whole company to learn Spanish and just did not no, it's like lean into they it. They built this multi-million dollar company to teach them Spanish. And the first language is like Dutch or something. Like they don't even get to Spanish for a while. That would be really funny. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So we just got confirmation it was Spanish. All right. So he he was trying. He was trying. Yes. We love to see it. (laughs) We love to see it. (laughs) Found is hosted by myself, TechCrunch senior reporter Becca Skutak, alongside senior reporter Dominic Midori Davis. Found is produced by Maggie Stamets with editing by Kel. Our illustrator is Bryce Durbin. Found's audience development and social media is managed by Morgan Little, Alyssa Stringer, and Natalie Kreisman. TechCrunch's audio products are managed by Henry Pickovit. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week.